Hey, good morning, church. Uh, what a joy to get to join you here on mission this morning, whether you're uh, chiming in virtually, whether you're watching us at a later date, you're on a run, you're in the car, whatever. Let me just bring you greetings on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Taylor. Um, I am on staff with a organization called Arrow Leadership. Uh, that's where I first met your pastor. I had a chance to walk with him and be his leadership partners, coach for a couple of years. I continue on uh, to be part of his life through a learning uh, leadership community that he is part of monthly. Um, what that means is if there is anything good about your pastor, uh, you're welcome. You know, I take full credit. Uh, it's been a joy. <laughs> Only joking. Uh, and if there's things that he's still trying to work out, listen, I'm right there with you. We're praying for him. Uh, he's just a human and uh, he's just trying to work it out. And uh, But uh, all honesty, though, I have sat with your pastor. I've seen his heart for his community. I've heard his heart for you, his church. Um, for those of you that are in Christ, I've seen him through tears, uh, yearn for you to continue to be at one, to be at unified, to grow in your faith. For those of you that might be in a searching space right now, uh, you've yet to come to know Jesus. Um, I've seen him through tears, yearn for you to know the love and the goodness and the mercy that is Christ Jesus. For your community and those that are sometimes marginalized, sometimes the world that the church, and we'll talk about here in a moment, that sometimes doesn't see, you have a pastor that has eyes to see the least and the last and the lost of those in your community. Um, and I'm so thankful for him. And uh, I know, I joke, I know he's not perfect. None of us are. Uh, but I'm thankful for his love for Jesus and his love for you. You know, when he contacted me, he asked me a question. He said, Taylor, you know, I'm, um, I'm going to be taking a little space here. And uh, I'd love to be able to continue to help our people grow in this new year. And I think there's some kind of some big words that we need to keep growing in. And I love the concept of what that looks like. And he asked me real quick. He's like, hey, if you had a few minutes uh, to talk to my church uh, about anything around uh, kind of hot topics, big theological words, what would it be? And I, I think I took about 30 seconds, maybe 15 seconds to really pray about it, to think about it. My answer always is when someone asks me to preach, it's yes and amen. Uh, I love the proclamation and the preaching of God's word. So if you're here this morning and you're like, oh man, I don't really love preaching. Hang on. We're going to get through this. It's going to be good. I love it. When God's word comes alive, there's nothing like it. The second thing is I quickly told him, I want to talk about the church. I want to talk about the beauty of her. I want to talk about the brokenness of her. I want to talk about the potential of her. I want to be real. I want to be honest. I want to be genuine. I want your people to understand the beauty of that is the church. So my word this week for you is ecclesiology. It's what we now know, if you do a quick Wikipedia study, as the study of the church. It's history, it's foundations, it's story. It comes from this Greek word, the ecclesia, and basically what that meant in Greek was a distinct certain people gathering that had structure, that had boundaries, that had certain membership of how to get in and order that guided. That's all. There were ecclesias probably all over the place. Uh, I tell people all the time, don't get caught up on some of these words because these words are man-made efforts trying to describe the vastness and the beauty of what God's word gives us. The ecclesia is nothing more for you and I that are found in Christ Jesus this morning as the gathering of Christ pe Christ's people under the order and structure of what we call a church, God's people, with a redemptive story that has a mission and a purpose to seek and save those that are not found in Christ. This is the church. Now listen, is the church perfect? Let me just lay down some ground rules though. I'm not like crazy, all right? I'm not like this preacher guy that's like never reading the news, so heavenly minded, no earthly good. I get it. You know, in the early 1980s here in the States, there was this um, TV show. You might know it. I don't know if they made it to Canada. I assume it did. Uh, that This TV show that came out, and it was called 
Cheers. You remember the word? Remember Cheers? Sometimes I want to go where what? Where everybody knows my name. Sometimes I want to go where all the troubles are all the same. This was the theme song that guided this 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 many series this this television series that was basically a group of people that found themselves from all different walks of life coming into this bar in Boston, Massachusetts that basically did life together. And the heartbeat of it was you have troubles, I have troubles, but in this place we find each other and we try to work out our troubles in a way that actually makes sense and actually might simply work. And it was a viral success, huge success. Why? Because of the heart of it, I believe every single man, woman, and child here is looking for a place of acceptance, is looking for a place of belonging, and ultimately looking for a place of purpose. Now, what's the difference between Cheers and the church? What's the difference in Cheers, this, this lab, local gathering of people showing up in Boston at this local bar, maybe in your community? Let me tell you, there may be belonging there. I'm not going to argue it. I'm not going to deny it. There may be true acceptance. I'm not going to argue it. I'm not going to deny it. But I will fight to my death that there is no purpose in what was happening in that Boston, Massachusetts bar so many years ago in the 1980s. I would argue that the church provides you and I a purpose that cannot be replicated by any said organization this side of heaven because it was created in the heart of God for God's people and for the world. And the church is that. But listen, like I said, I'm not a crazy person. I know the church is broken. Wouldn't it be fun if we were all gathered right now to pass a microphone around and just talk about our imperfections? You know, in the typical world today, this is kind of how the church is seen. This is how the church works. The ecclesia, the ecclesia, the ecclesiology study of the church would show this today. It's a gathering of hypocrites that are consuming uh, alcohol by way too much, uh, putting things in their body that are not right, not holy throughout the week, consuming pornography two, three times, four times a week, lazy, maybe picking up their Bible, maybe once a week, arguing with spouses, uh, running here, there, everywhere for kids, frustrated with society, hating their lives, disillusioned, discontented, desperate for meaning, really living no different, yet every Sunday morning picks all of the kids, hops in the minivan, shows up for about 60, 90 minutes to this place called church and checks it off. And we wonder why the, the community around us goes hypocrites. We wonder why the community around us goes, I see financial embezzlement. I see sexual immorality. I see abuse of power. I see all these things happening in this so-called church. Why in the world would I want to commit my life to be part of this thing called the ecclesia, the gathering of God's people, when all I see are these things? And listen, I've been in ministry. I've been in the church for over 20 years now. And in my 20 some odd years, I can systematically go through all of those things I just mentioned because I've seen them firsthand. I've lived them firsthand. Yet I'm more committed to the cause of the church today, the ecclesiology of the church than ever before. And my hope this morning is that you would not come into this space thinking that I'm just trying to sell you on your particular church or your particular pastor because that is not my purpose. That's not my mission. My purpose and mission is that you would walk away from this gathering, this space this morning, and that you would love the church in a way that you haven't in maybe the first time or a long time. You would commit or recommit your life to the purpose and the mission of the church, maybe for the first time or again, the first time in a long time in a way that you haven't in a long time done, and that you'd begin to believe again there is purpose behind the church. And though she is broken, she is being made beautiful. Where does it come from? 
You know, Ephesians 5, you have your text with you. I'll invite you to turn there. We're going to look at just a few passages here this morning because there's so many places that we could jump around and look around. But I think it's good to start in some ways just really looking at this heartbeat. I'm going to call the bride oftentimes this morning the church. I'm going to call her she. And the reason I'm doing that, it comes from Ephesians 5. Look at Ephesians 5. It's an interesting statement that Paul's making about the church. He's trying to lay down an argument for the reasoning for the church. One of the first people to ever mention the church out of Jesus himself. We'll talk about that here in a second. But let's lay the framework. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, he actually seems like he's giving a marriage discourse. You're like, hey, Taylor, um, we're talking about ecclesiology, not marriage. What's going on here? But let me break it down for you. He says, husbands. I want you to love your wives. I want you to love your wives just as Christ loved the, what is it? Type in the chat, say it out loud. That's right, the church. And he gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of water through the word and to present her to himself as a, you ready? Radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. I want you to see a couple things right now from the beginning of this text about understanding the ecclesia, the understanding of the theology behind the church itself, is that what God has laid out for us is whether you like the church or not, whether your mom likes it or your wife likes it or your dad likes it or your husband likes it or your parents like it or your friends like it, no matter what you may think about the church this day, I want you to know first that God loves the church. And he loves the church so much that he sent his one and only son for the church. And Apostle Paul tells us that, men, you're supposed to love your bride as Christ loved the church. And how did Christ love the church? He tells me a couple things. He tells me that he loves her even though she's broken. So when she, when his task is to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, it tells me that she's probably a little bit dirty. It tells me she's probably got some blind spots. It tells me that maybe, just maybe, God knew that there was going to be sexual immorality in the church. There was going to be disunity. There was going to be embezzlement. There was going to be gossip. There was going to be hypocrisy. There was going to be all these things in the gathering of these specific ecclesia. And just maybe, he said, but I don't care. I love her so much, I'm going to send my son to fight for her to defend her, to never give up on her, to keep believing the best about her, to cleanse her, to work with her, to do whatever he can to present her beautiful one day. Revelation chapter 7 says one day there's going to be another wedding where we are going to be as the church, the gathering of God's people presented back to Jesus, our bridegroom. And at that point, all the uglies, all the distortions, all the the hypocrisy and all the things we've mentioned will now be made new when he presents us back afresh to our Father in heaven. But right now, we're in a process of being made new. He tells me he knows that there's brokenness. He also tells me, though, that she's worth fighting for. He says, husbands, don't give up for her. Cleanse her with water and listen, to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. It tells me that he believes, not only do I love the church, I believe the best about the church. I believe that one day she will be presented radiant, without blemish, without blame. Church, I think that we need a renewed vision of what the church not only is, we don't want to be stupid, we don't want to ignore it, we don't want to be like, oh, no, no, the church is amazing. We want it one with one lens, go, man, she is broken, but we can't negate the other lens. And this other lens is that, man, Christ loves her. She is his bride. We can't give up on her. We can't stop meeting together as many are in the habits of doing, as Apostle Paul said. We got to keep fighting for the purpose and the mission that Christ has given us because it is worth the fight. It is worth the battle. We cannot give up. And this is the command he gives us as husbands. I'm a husband of Joanna. Is Joanna perfect? My goodness, no. We just celebrated our 21st anniversary. It was so good. It was amazing. It was awesome. And we sat there, we joked about like, what do we love about each other? And we're like, oh, I love you. 
you're so funny and you're kind and you're gentle and you're getting it's all good, good. And then we had an honest conversation and I hate this. I'm married to a marriage and family therapist, which is hashtag never marry a marriage therapist because you're going to have a great marriage, but it's never going to be good enough. All right. All joking aside, Joanna, if you're watching this, I absolutely love you so much. But seriously, she sometimes goes, how can we keep getting better? And then she asks this question, are there things about us that needs to change? And I hate that question because part of me is just like, I don't want to deal with it. I just want to be happy. I want to be holy. I want to focus on what's right and be good. And I can sometimes fall into that same caveat when I see the church. I can kind of fall into it. But here's the thing, we can't fall into any camp too far to the left or too far to the right. We can't be in the camp that only sees the negative about the church. All the things I mentioned, she's this and that and this and that and this and that. But we also can't be so ignorant that we go, yeah, but she's amazing and she's perfect and she's radiant. She's, she's, no, we're going to have to live in this tension today. And this is the ecclesiology. This is the study of what makes the church so unique. It is living in current reality, but believing about what our preferred future is to look like. And the crazy part about it, we'll see here in just a moment, is that the answer to the preferred future is you and I. It's you and I right now. As we start 2022, we are God's plan A to get his bride to her preferred future. Blows my mind. Absolutely blows my mind. We got to find that tension and live in it. I don't know where you're at about the church, but I want you to know that God loves her. God loves her. And for those of you that might be on here and says, man, I love Jesus, but I really don't like this church. Hey, I love God. I love worship. I love teaching. I just love podcasting. I just love like, you know, streaming elevation worship or Hillsong or fill in your, your worship blank, whatever it may be. That's all well and good. But I want you to know this morning that there is something distinct about being with God's people under God's authority, under the leadership that God has given a Pacific church at a Pacific time, there's something unique. It's not, you can't reproduce it. You can't recreate it. There is a prescription that God has given us that helps kind of lay out for us some things I want to get on your radar when you think about this ecclesia. Not only does God love her, does he see her blemishes? Yes. Is he's working hard to make her perfect? We are the we are the plan that God has to make her perfect. But I think we need to go back a little bit. We need to understand. I got like a few points. I learned these in seminary. So I'm going to look down a couple times to make sure I'm saying these right. They're, they're not coming from me. They're coming from a band with professors and other pastors in my life that have helped me form my own theology about the church. But I think it's important that we see how God says it. You know, when you think about the church, my first take on it is that it starts with Matthew 16. And Matthew, we're not going to have time to go to all these, but Matthew 16, verse 13, the church began with a, a, a person's confession. You, you know it. In, in Matthew, uh, there's this moment where this man named Peter, once Simon, now Peter, God says, Jesus says, hey, Peter, upon you, I'm going to build my church. First time, my ecclesia is going to be called the gathering of God's people, and, and it's going to be built upon you. Now, the, the Catholic brothers and sisters have taken that very literal, and they said it's based on a man, and that's how we have moved on the Catholic church to have a singular priest that is the conduit of grace and truth for all the people that choose to be between God and man. They have a priest. There's one person, this, this rock. The Protestant Reformation a few hundred years ago, Martin Luther really had this moment that God raised him up to say, you know what, wait a second. I believe in First Peter, the, the royal priesthood of all believers, and that in this new covenant that we have in the New Testament, there's no longer slave or Jew or Gentile or man or woman. We are all one in Christ. And the same Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the same Holy Spirit that resides in each of us, as John talks about. And therefore, by confession of faith, I will build my church in this new covenant upon every man, woman, and child that makes a confession of faith in me and willing to live their life for me. And this is the beauty of the church in, in the New Covenant. It's, it's being built today 
upon every man, woman, and child, in every household, uh, in, in every street, in every neighborhood, in every network of, of people that are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And it begins with a confession, the same confession that Peter made. Uh, Who do you say I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ. You are the Christ. And every time we declare, Jesus, you are the Christ, we're saying, I am allowing you to build your church upon me and my life. And I pray there's a holy humbleness that comes from that. I pray there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a strategic boldness that you feel in your spirit to go, man, I do confess, Jesus, you are the Christ. You are the one and only Son of God. But, but that's, that's Pastor Rob's job. That's the elders or the deacons or whatever your leadership structures in your church. They're responsible to build the church. I'm just like, I'm just trying to stay married. I, I'm just trying to like keep these kids alive. I'm just trying to get through high school. Um, I'm just trying to live my life. No, no, no. See, that's the thing. The church is built upon your confession of faith. And it's so beautiful because it gives you every day a mission. No matter what your Enneagram is, no matter what your GPA is, no matter what your, your, your salary is, no matter what your title is, no matter, no matter what, if you're part of the church of Jesus Christ, you get to wake every day with a purpose and a mission to know that you've been called by God, you are seen by God, and you have a mission of God to testify and to give every man, woman, and child multiple opportunities to say yes to to Jesus. And that's the end goal of your life. And if you live that purpose and that mission every day under the authority of scripture and of his church, my goodness, the impact you will have this side of heaven. So number one, he says it's, it starts with a, a confession uh, it began many years ago. The other thing, First Timothy chapter 3, I want you to know that it is grounded and rooted in truth. That the idea of a church is not some man-made idea that Pastor Rob came up with. Hey, I want to start a church, plant a church. No, no, no. This is grounded in truth. The biblical understanding of the church was rooted in God's word. This is where we got the understanding of there would be a gathering of people that love the Lord, that they have a central purpose and mission to expose the mystery of the gospel to the world, to love the lost, to love the orphans, to love the widows, to love the prisoners, to love each other, and ultimately to love those that are far from Jesus. You have the mission of the church. This is not a man-made idea. This is grounded and rooted in truth. And he says the way this is going to work out in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, not only does it start with the confession that's grounded in truth, it's going to function as a body. And that you are part of a body there where you're at. I'm part of the body here in Canton, Ohio. Uh, I grew up in Luxembourg in a small little European country. I have friends in, in, in East Africa, uh, in Russia right now, in Central America. Uh, Arrow Leadership serves about 1,200 alumni all over the world. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of little temples that are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, that are waking up every day on purpose and mission with and for Jesus, seeking to advance his kingdom, is part of the body of Christ. It is both local and it is universal. That is the beauty and the glory of this thing called the church. And oh, she's an unstoppable force when we can get above sometimes the things that separate us and look at the things that unify us. We truly are an unstoppable force. We talked a moment ago that we're a family, that we are a temple. First Peter 2, 4 talks about this principle that the body, the, the church is going to be built upon this, this temple. Uh, it's what the church always knew in the early church. It was like, we got we to gotta build the temple. In the old covenant, it was always, we got to build the temple. And Jesus came along, and what did he do? He said, I'm going to tear down this temple in three days. I'm tearing it down. I'm shredding your whole idea of what this looks. The, the, the dividing wall is going to be ripped, and we know the story. Man, he... He died on the cross and he rose from the grave and that, that, that temple was destroyed. And what was rebuilt was the people of God. You and I 
Every man, woman, and child that's listening to this is part of the mission and the glory of God and how he's building the church. It's this temple of what it looks like. I guess what I want you to hear this morning is that when it comes to the church, God loves her. Whether you do, I pray that I'm in, in stoking your fire, motivating you to love her, but God loves her. The second thing is, it's not a man-made idea. This is an idea that was birthed in the heart of God. Whether, whether, whether it's started with a confession or there's a pillar of truth or, 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 or let me throw this one at you real quick and I'll be cognizant of time, I promise. But the other uniqueness of the church is that, that she's guided by a certain rule and order of leaders. You can look at 1 Corinthians 12, 28 or Ephesians 4, 11 to 12. There's an order. Hebrews 12 talks about God's a God of order and all of these little gatherings, both locally and universally. Yes, there's every man, woman, and child waking up on mission every day, but they says there are elders and there's deacons and there's pastors. And they are worth double. That's why pastors are paid today. Sometimes they're paid full-time salaries. Sometimes they're bivocational. Sometimes they're volunteer because the church isn't able to, to pay for them yet. But I have a huge heart for the pastor. The pastor's rooted in the heart of God. It goes all the way back to the original 12 tribes, if you want to. We want to go way back. From the very beginning, there were 12 tribes that were set apart. But one of the tribes, the tribe of Levi, he said, you're going to have no land. You're going to have no money. You're not going to be able to make money for your families. You're going to be my tribe that is set apart. And you're going to have to trust me. All the other tribes are going to help take care of you as you help be a conduit of grace and truth for them. As we move on through the Old Testament, there's always a remnant of God's people, I dare say an ecclesia, a gathering of God's people that remain faithful. The tribe of Levi remains steadfast in truth, always being a remnant, fighting for the best of God's people. Prophets rose up, prophetesses rose up. We then get into this new covenant we're at today. And now all of a sudden we have all these people that are dwelt with the Holy Spirit. The remnant is growing, but we still have not so much one tribe. We have certain called ones. These pastors, your pastor, that at some point in their story said, man, God has called me not only to himself through salvation, to commit my life through sanctification. He's actually called me to vocation, to commit my life to love and shepherd his church. Listen, the order of the church is so unique because the pastor is good for the church. Are all pastors good? My goodness, no. They're not perfect. There's some very corrupt ones. But the heartbeat of the pastoral leader is the pastors of shepherd. They are to serve the flock. It is good for you and your family to be under the authority of pastors and leaders that are standing on your behalf, that are fighting for your best. It's good for you. I always feel when I get to moments like these that I, I feel like I'm not out of message, but I start to get a little bit low on time. I, I think about what I, what I, if I could be with you, this is the last time you ever get to spend time with me. I want you to know anything about the ecclesiology. I want you to go, it's the study of the church, but it's not just the church that I know. The church is so much bigger than what I understand her to be. She is loved by God. She is set apart for Christ. She is a part. I am the part of the church every day that he is building into. So every time I judge the church, it's always I'm judging myself. Every time I throw rocks at the church, I'm throwing rocks at myself. Every time I question the church, I'm questioning myself because I am the church. Every time I make a confession of faith that says, who is the Christ? You are the Christ, the Son of God. I am the church and he's building his church through me. So what do we do with it? A couple things I invite you to do with it. And we'll land the ship with this, I promise you. This, uh, this came out of a, of a message I heard not so long ago. It comes from Pastor Todd Doggard. A uh, wonderful text. I thought he did a great job of summing it up. And he said like this. He said, if the church is a family, number one, if you're going to take notes, if the church is a family, 
2 Corinthians 6, 18, then my job, I need to make myself at home at that church. I want to encourage you to make yourself at home at your church. Let it be your home. Let it be a place that you can come to. Let it be a place that you fight for. Let it be a place that you take care of. Let it be a place that you take pride in. Let it be a place that you are proud to bring people to. Let it be a place that, that you can say, man, I am unashamed of my home. It's not a house. It's a home. It's, it's where my family is. It, it's, where, it's where we can fight and disagree, but we're connected and we're not giving up on each other. There's nothing that's going to separate us because we're in this together. If it's a family, I'm going to make it my home. If it is a temple, as we talked about, 1 Peter 2, 4 to 8, if it is a temple and I am the temple of Christ that God is building within, then I, I'm going to renew my commitment to offer my body as a holy and living sacrifice. Lord, use me. I don't want to be a judger. I don't want to be all about frustration. I want to be about faith and hope. And I actually want to tell people, I love the church. She's broken, but her potential of beauty is like nothing else. She has a place of a mission and purpose, a place for people to come to know the one and only true son of God, a place to be loved, a place to be nurtured, a place to be taken care of, a place of service and sacrifice, a place of generosity, a place of kindness, a place of acceptance. If it's a temple, then make me a living sacrifice for her for the remainder of my life, whether I have five years, 10 years, 30 years to go, make me a sacrifice. If she's a body, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 27, then make me part of it. I am going to encourage you to talk to your pastor. Flood his email this week. I want to be part of the church. I want to make her beautiful. I want to be part of the answer, not just pointing out the problems. Flood his email this week with saying, Pastor Rob, this is blank. I want to be greater part of making this church beautiful in the eyes of God. Where can I serve? What can I do? I want to get started. If it's a body, I want to be part of it. And finally, if it's a bride, if she is the bride of Christ, I want to help her be pure. I want to fight for the best of her. If I'm an older man or an older woman in the faith, I want to train some of the younger ones. If I'm a younger man or woman in the faith right now in the church, I want to reach up. I want to reach out and say, would someone see me, develop me, disciple me? I'm silently suffering for too long by myself. And God has said in the church, you do not have to be alone. You are one connect, you're one call, you are, are one raising of a hand, one going to from being part of something in communal that was birthed on the other side of heaven being played out today right here in this place. Speak up, speak out, be seen. Church, I just want to challenge you that we are, every time you make a confession of faith in Christ, you are part of the ecclesiology that we know of at the church. And our time is now. Our time is now. I'll end it with a story. When I think about the, the confessing church, my mind always goes back to another pastor from a number of years ago, the end of World War II, named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a pastor in Germany and there was a faithful remnant of leaders just like Pastor Rob that were loving their church and it was, she was broken and she was, you name it. But they were holding forth the word of God. They were teaching it. They were gathering. They were practicing uh, the, the, the uh, realities of the faith. Acts 2, 42, they were meeting together, fellowshipping together. They were doing the work of the Lord. But over time, the national church began to align with Nazi Germany. And there are stories of, 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 of uh, Jews going by on the way to concentration camps instead of the church rising up to say, not on our watch, this is not in the heart of God. This goes against the mission of God to be accepting, to be seeing, to be forgiving, to be mercy filled. Instead of giving their lives for this mission, they would actually change their order of worship so that as the railway went by, they would play music louder so they didn't have to hear it in order to feel guilty about it. 
Pastors like your pastor, pastors like Dietrich Bonhoeffer put a line in the sand. They say, not for me and my church. We are going to fight to stay together, to stay in the heart of God, to stay true to scripture. We are going to start what they call the confessing church. And a remnant of pastors in Germany came together and they said, as for me and my house, my church, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to practice the, the doctrines of the faith, of baptism and of communion and of teaching, and of preaching, of discipleship. We're going to see each other. We're going to see the lost. And we're going to stand against injustices. And if that means stay against even our country at this time, we are going to stand against our country in the light of what God has put on our heart. We're going to do it together on mission and in unity. And let me tell you, that sounds motivating and inspiring, but it was destructive. This confessing church started seeing pastors picked off one by one, church members put in their own concentration camps. Ultimately, Bonhoeffer, one of the early leaders of this, found himself in a concentration camp just a number of weeks before World War II came to conclusion, and he gave his life for this confessing church. Church, my question to you and I this morning is that in the year 2022, the time is on our watch. Yes, there may not be Jews going by the concentration camps that we hear and we see, but there are injustices all around us. There is people hurting and starving and fighting and racism. There is pornography and, 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 and orphans and widows that are, that are alone and lonely. There are, I can go through the social justice issues Listen, I am not calling you to be a social justice movement. I'm calling you to be the church of Jesus Christ that believes every man, woman, and child needs to understand the love of Jesus Christ. The most effective way to reach the lost is to be unified one to another, to come under the authority of Scripture, under the banner of the godly leaders that God has put over you, to come into alignment with purpose and mission, and to reach those that are far from Jesus. And justices will come into alignment when that is done. What's it going to cost? It could cost your life. It could cost your very life. And my heart is that you this day would say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will commit our lives to the local church. We will surrender our lives to the banner and lordship of Jesus Christ, to the Holy Scripture. And I will die for the Scripture. I will die for, for my brother and sister in Christ. And I will die for the beauty of the church. It is a high calling it is high opportunity, and it's a high responsibility. Church, this is the study of the church. This is the ecclesiology that we know today in 2022. She cannot stay silent because we know that in the end, she will be presented back one day, holy and blameless without, without blemish. And I pray that you and I would be part of God's holy and divine mission that he has called the church. May it be true in Canton, Ohio. May it be true where you are to this day. For God's glory, forever, for always. He is building his church. He is advancing his kingdom through you and I. We are God's plan A. Let's not give up on her. Let's keep fighting for her every day until Christ should return. I'm praying for you. Love you. Thankful for your pastor. Thankful that we are part of the same church. Thankful that we wake up on mission every day to continue to advance his kingdom. God bless you. Bye-bye.